Welcome back. I'll take the clicker back if it's available. Thank you, Prabhu. So first, before I talk about selling books to Hindus, I want to give you a general outline of how I describe the process of selling a book anywhere to anyone. And then there's a special application for those great souls who already know about Bhagavad Gita, already have Bhagavad Gita, whose mother read Bhagavad Gita, whose grandmother memorized Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> so in presenting, for instance, the Bhagavad Gita in any given place, The first point is to make a conscious connection. As I mentioned earlier, the glance of another living entity is spiritual. Otherwise, what is it? There's a light coming from every living entity. And when you look into the eyes of another, you'll see that there's a conscious being there. And we have the wherewithal as humans, the human mind, we can ascertain what is the state of consciousness of a person by looking at their eyes and their face. For the most part. Some people, they call them poker face. Because they're able to hide what they're thinking, which cards they're holding. So the first thing that I do when I'm interacting with people is make sure that I've made the conscious connection. So one way that I do that is I say hi. I try it. Hold up your hand like this and point it at somebody, not me. Try, put up your hand, everyone. Point it at somebody, a person, a conscious living entity, and say hi. Now, did you notice when you said hi and that there's a beam from your own consciousness that comes out of you that hits the other person and comes back to you? That's why I noticed some of you, you were laughing. You're feeling jolly. Because all the devotees in this room, they want to be here, you want to be here, you're happy, you're well situated in spiritual life. So you're what we call ripe fruits. You're already ripe, spiritually ripe. If I was to hit my beam on somebody who wasn't ripe, what, what could happen? Manava, come over here. He's a very experienced book distributor, distributors in America and Canada. He'll come. Oh, is it okay? start over there. Now, uh, first we'll do a ripe fruit, then we'll do a medium ripe fruit, then we'll do an unripe fruit. So number one, start walking towards me from the couch. And just watch his countenance, he's a ripe fruit, and I go like, hi. Okay, ripe fruit, right? Okay, start over, go back. Now medium ripe. Hi. That was a little more than medium, but go. he can't help it. Okay, and now do an unripe, unripe fruit. Hi. He's still smiling. Okay, go back. No smiling. Do the totally unripe fruit. Hi. Yeah, he's even looking at me, and there's even a case where people don't even look at you. Don't even look at me. Pretend I don't exist, okay? Because that's what I've been doing to Krishna for many lifetimes. Hi. Now, you can see that these are, thank you, give him a hand. You can see these are, these are varieties of reactions. And there are a finite number of reactions because there are three modes of material nature. And there's a finite number of combinations and permutations of the modes of material nature, generally, that people are going to be under the spell of. And so when you say hi to them, don't take it personally. It's just where they're at. We're, we're scientists. We're not looking to uh, take it personally. Like, how come you didn't look at me? So how come you didn't look at Krishna? Um, the, so what you're looking for is data, information. And it doesn't matter to us what exactly the reaction is. We just want to get a reading so that we react properly. So Ishvare Taradine Shu Bali Sheshu Du Satsucha Prema Maitri Kripo Peksha Yakaroti Samadhyamaha. This describes the duty of the Madhyama Adhikari. The Madhyama, or the middle devotee, is a preacher. And there's four ways in which he or she interacts with the world. First way, Ishvare, the Lord. He gives, she gives prema to the Lord. 
adineshu means towards the devotees, he gives maitri, friendship. And then you have the balisheshu. Those means innocent people. For them, you give kripa. And then you have duisatsu, envious, people that don't like you. They don't want to acknowledge you. They don't like the idea of somebody spreading Krishna consciousness, or at least not their version anyway. And for them, upeksha. You leave them alone. Don't interact. I'm going to save you a lot of time right now. You can thank me later. Don't interact with people who are not interested in Krishna consciousness. I just saved you a lot of time. You can give me a few ground nuts later. <clears throat> That's what the Shastra said. You should let them go. So when you're picking fruits on a tree, which ones do you pick? Ripe fruits. Say ripe fruits. The unripe fruits, now I'll give you a scenario. There's an unripe fruit on the tree. I grab onto it. It won't come off. So I break the branch and I drag it down the street. Is that correct? Say, no, Vaisheshaka. Wrong. Bad. So same thing. You see somebody who's not interested, you should follow them to their car and keep asking them, could you take, could you take, could you take? They're not interested. You follow them to their car. Yes, is that correct? No, Vaisheshika, wrong, bad. You don't follow them. You let them go. Those are the four interactions. So what you're looking for is just like a policeman. I haven't seen any here with radar guns, but they have them in America. You know radar gun? Your car's going along and they shoot the car with the radar gun. The, the beam bounces off back to the, their little meter and it tells exactly how fast you're going. If you're going too fast, then they chase after you and they give you a ticket. So... When we go like this, this is our radar gun. You go, hi, hi. He said, hi, he's a ripe fruit. He's smiling, he's open. I can tell a lot about him just by that one split second interaction. It's amazing, within a millisecond, I can assess, is this person ripe, medium ripe, not ripe, completely unripe. And you have to act accordingly. That's how you do it. You're not trying to convince everybody the success isn't that you sell a book to everybody. You can't do that. Even Krishna doesn't do that. It's, it's not the process. The process is to sort out and try to find the ripest fruits you can. And if you want, if you're, if you're not feeling fully energetic, you can turn the dial down and say, I'm only going for the completely ripe fruits. I'm not even going to try on the medium ripe fruits. Either they come to me or forget it. Doesn't that make it easier? No fear. I mean, there's no anxiety. You can just go out and say, like, I'll just, if people come to me, fine. And if they don't, then that's all right. I'm happy. I, I'm doing the right thing. I did my duty. I went out. You don't have to perform. You don't have to do circus tricks and convince somebody that's not convincible. It's not possible. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You can learn, lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can lead a man to wisdom, but you can't make him think. So, select. So then here's another trick we use in America that's very popular and it's a way to make uh, human contact with people and they find it, most people find it almost irresistible. Prabhu? Prabhu? Now you try it, Nirkula. Yep, try it there. Try there, with Mataji. Hey, she did it. So, handshakes are very, take a big commitment. You gotta hold somebody else's hands, who knows what they've been touching. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a big deal. They feel like, eh. So, if you go like this, uh, people, they actually, like make, so, so on a real busy street, like just recently in San Francisco, during, during Black Friday, during their marathon, I just stood on the street, go like this to people. And then eventually someone's go boom, like that. Then you know, like you, you start to make a little more of a conscious connection with people. So you can try this. It's not illegal. No one minds any kind of little interaction like this. And you see what happens. It's just a little tap like that. And I, people are so attracted to this. I've had people across the street and I go, hi, and they look over, they go, hi, and I go like this. And they'll cross the street just to do the fist bump. <laughs> Not everybody will, but some people, and, and you can see that this is, 
you know, people are craving physical, there's some kind of connection with another living being, you know, because it's our nature, relationships. So this is where it starts, to make the relationship. Oftentimes devotees are holding a, a book and then they see people and they just walk up and they go, here, you know, and just trying to jam it in their hands. What happened? I forgot to turn that on. So people don't know why you're there. You didn't assess them first. They can be ripe, unripe, whatever. That's not absolutely wrong, but I, I find that if you open the door through a conscious contact, that helps. The next principle is that qualify. So qualify means that they ha it helps if they know why you're handing them over a book. So one of the ways to qualify somebody, give them a little interview. Did you ever, anybody here take an interview to get a job before? Only three people. That's good, you're all retired, okay. So, so you can interview people very simply by asking them where they're from. And I generally tell people where I'm from first. So I'll say, I'm from America, where are you from? India, I love India. Now say like a town you're from. I'm, I'm from America, where are you from? No, that's not a town, say a town. Bang I love Bangalore. So wherever they're from, you love it. And <laughs> Lord Krishna at Kurukshetra, the Kurukshetra time when he was there at the eclipse, and he spoke these verses about how people worship their homeland. So this is a way to a person's heart really quickly. You ask where they're from. You tell them first. You volunteer your information. I'm from, I'm from Mysore. Where are you from? Bangalore. I love Bangalore. If you love where they're from, you love them. In fact, it's better than loving them because Prabhupada said, love me, love their dog. And I've tried this around my neighborhood. A lot of people walk in their dog. If I walk up to them and I say hi, they get creeped out because they're thinking like, why is this person saying hi to me on a walk? You know, you know, it just seems weird. Like, what do they want? But if I walk up to somebody and say, nice dog, they immediately like, wow, who is this person? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's kind of cute. You know, what kind of dog is it? And, you know, you have this relationship. So if you appreciate where somebody's from, the qualification, now that becomes their qualification for taking the book. So that's the next stage. I say, where are you from? I'm Bangalore. Oh, I love Bangalore. Here, I'll show you one too. So now the door is open. You made a little assessment. Now you qualify them. They're from a place that you love. That's why you're showing them the book. And then as you're handing the book over, you can say something, what's in it for them? Because that's the radio station that everybody in the universe is tuned into. You know the call numbers? W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? That's what every, everyone is tuned to. So I tell people as I'm handing the book over, this is a book on yoga and meditation. It shows you how to get free from stress. Okay, please repeat after me. This is a book on yoga and meditation that shows you how to get free from stress. Okay, so now there's a secret in communication, and I'm going to talk about this later if we have time in the short course called Communications 101, and that is that questions are a hook. Questions are the answer. This is how to lead a conversation and hold it in the, make it go in the direction that you want to go, is to ask questions. It's not to tell, 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 but it's to ask, ask, ask. So you have to become a master asker. So the next thing is when I'm handing the book over, say books on yoga meditation that shows you how to get free from stress. They're hearing a little bit of what's in it for them. And as the book's going into their hand, I ask them a question to hold everything in place. And I'll say, You've heard of stress, right? Have any of you heard of stress? You're all going, <laughs> yeah, and that's what most people do. They, yeah, right. Uh, of course I've heard of stress. And then I'll say, really? Because you don't look stressed. You look very peaceful. In fact, you look spiritual. Everyone say, you look spiritual. <laughs> now turn to somebody next to you and say, you look spiritual. You look spiritual. 
How do you feel when somebody tells you that? You feel spiritual. How do you feel when you walk into the, you know, out of your apartment, your ashram, and someone comes up to you and go, you look tired. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? You look tired. How do you feel? You start feeling tired, or you look in the mirror and go, God, I do look. How about if someone goes up, look, comes up to you and goes, you look terrible. <laughs> Probably only your close friends will tell you, you look terrible. What's wrong? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I, then you start thinking of reasons why you feel terrible. Now, here's the, here's the magic. When you ask somebody, you say, you look spiritual. When you tell them that, they achieve instant self-realization. <laughs> because they are spiritual, they just forgot. That's our philosophy. They forgot that they're spiritual. They're walking around pretending to be something else, non-spiritual, but they're actually just spiritual. If you say, you look spiritual, then they suddenly, you'll see a light go off and go, oh my God, I forgot all about Krishna. I forgot about the spiritual world. I'm a spiritual being. I mean, these things are going through their head. And now comes the most important question that I'll mention in the whole seminar. And if this is the only thing that you take away with you today, you'll, it'll still be worth all your time. Are you ready? What's your secret? Everyone say it. Now, I want you to turn somebody next to you and say, you look spiritual, what's your secret? Go. You look spiritual, what's your secret? So, did they tell you? Okay. Now, let me tell you the psychology behind this. It's a little bit subtle. The reason that people don't like to get approached with a book or a book by a book distributor is because People don't like condescension. They like to feel that they're the center. They know everything. They know which way they're going in life. And what we're doing when we walk up to somebody and say, here, take this book, tacitly, we are saying, your life is messed up. I'm going to help you out here. I'm going to rescue you from yourself, from your self that's on a wrong track. That's what we're saying, really. And that's what people perceive when we come up here, take a book. And they're feeling like, you know, I'm fine. You get away from me. I'm better than you are, right? That's what, that's what everyone internally is thinking. In fact, kids, you know, if a parent tries to instruct a kid, it's like, I know, I know. If a spouse tries to instruct the other spouse, ah, leave me alone. I'm not grouchy. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Don't worry. Everyone's like that. That's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, be humble. Just be humble. Then the, all the secrets of the universe can come in. So... Now we change roles. Instead of I'm the person who's, who's intervening in your life and telling you that you're messed up, what I'm doing by asking what's your secret, and it's the way you say it, what's your secret? How did you get so spiritual? Then all of a sudden, you're putting them on the Vyasasana. <laughs> and you're sitting down there. You're the disciple. You do that. Now, this is the process for selling a book or preaching Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada taught us. He said... There's a verse, actually, that you're, you put a straw in your mouth, you go to a person, you fall down at his feet, and you say, you know, you're brilliant. You know everything. It's like, it's amazing. And then, then you tell him, now you forget everything. And let me tell you about Lord Chaitanya. So this is in like a needle, out like a plow. So the point is, psychologically, when you ask them this question, now they may give you some information. So what's your secret? Now you can sort of gauge what mode of nature they're in. In America, people in the mode of ignorance, you say, what's your secret? You look spiritual, they'll say, I smoke marijuana. <laughs> Other people in the mode of passion, they say, ah, I'm just very organized, I work really hard. People in the mode of goodness say, oh, I do yoga, I meditate. And so a lot of people, they'll say, I don't know, I don't have a secret. And they say, you must just be a natural. Just be, you must be, you, you're just a natural then, right? So you get a little feedback. Now you've handed them the book, and this is the point at which you're showing them their book. So when they tell you what their secret is or you tell them that they're a natural, then you take the book back and you can show them something about the book. So show and tell. Everything that's needed is in or on the book to sell the book. For instance, on a Bhagavad Gita, there's pictures like changing bodies. There's some universities in the front. There's people who have read the book. 
Of course, this is a little different in India because people have heard of the Bhagavad Gita, but if you're talking to people who aren't acquainted, then you can show them the back cover. You can show them this was read by people like Gandhi, the Beatles, and so on. And then you can show it's used in, used in universities. You can show them the changing bodies picture. That's in every Gita. And say, look it, we start here and show the baby. We end up here, show the person leaving the body and say, we're all just passing through. And you can ask them another question, where are you in this? And they'll look at it and they go, oh, I'm right here. And then you can ask them, have you heard of karma? And what does karma mean to you? What does karma mean to you? He said, action and reaction. Now watch my reaction. I go, whoa, that's an amazing explanation. If more people in the world thought like you, the world would be a better place to live. Now I'm going to ask you, what does karma mean? Uh, what does karma mean to you? Answer. They're giving the microphone so it's... Okay, you know, watch me now because you have to do this in a second. What does karma mean to you? Yeah, my past, present, past and present actions and reactions, thoughts. Whoa, I really like the way you put things. If more people in the world thought like you, it would be a better world to live in. <laughs> now you ask me, you have a spokesperson, you ask me what karma means to me, just you ask me, and then all of you react, you go, as soon as I tell you that what karma means to me, I want you all, keep your hands up, you go like this, whoa, I really like the way you put things if more people in the world thought like you, the world um, would be a better place to live. Are you ready? Go ahead and ask me. You ask me. What do you mean by karma? No. What does karma mean to you? What, what karma means to you? What does karma mean to you? What does karma mean to you? Well, you know, there's rainbows and butterflies and <laughs> things go up and down. It's like cool, man. <laughs> I really like the way you put things. If more people in the world thought like you, it would be a better world to live, be a better place to live, okay? And you can use that line uh, anytime in your presentation. You can always say that to people. Whoa, I really like the way you put things. I really like the way you think. If more people in the world thought like you, it would be a better place to live. Okay, now, um, do we have a Gita here? Does it, ha it doesn't have the yogi, does it? With the coming out of his head? In the, in the English Bhagavad Gita, there's a picture of a yogi meditating and the, he's popping out of his head. So at this point, we ask people, what do you do professionally? Yes. Yeah, what is? No, I'm asking you, what do you do professionally? What do you do professionally? No, I'm asking you. <laughs> What do you do professionally? I'm a professor. Professor. And then I'll show them this picture. You see this picture? Yes, I'm seeing. Does everyone see that? The yogi popping and I said, okay, I'm going to ask you again. You tell me, professor. What do you do professionally? I teach and do research. What do you teach? I teach to mechanical engineering students. Really? This guy used to teach mechanical engineering. <laughs> Now, that's exactly what you want to happen is when they're laughing, that's when you hand the book back. Yeah. And half the people, when you say, really, this guy used to be a mechanical engineer, this guy used to be a ballet dancer, he used to do Bart Nottingham, whatever it is they do, you tell them that's what they do. The more specific you can be, like if they say engineer, you go, what kind of engineer? And they go, oh, I'm, a, I'm a civil engineer. Really? This guy used to be a civil engineer. Then half the people, they'll laugh right away, and the other half say, really? And then you go, no, not really. And then they'll laugh. And as soon as they're laughing, then you hand the book back and you give them the book. And say, now, we don't sell these. We don't sell these like in a bookstore. We only ask for donation. We don't need the money. But when you give in return for spiritual knowledge, it connects you to the previous teachers who have passed it down over many generations and it allows you to enter deeply within the book. So the way I explain the donation, it's for them. It's not for me. Money is not an issue for me. I'm not asking tit for tat. I'm not trying to, you know, sell the book. But what I'm doing, I'm actually asking for dakshina, but not for me, for
for the previous acharyas who gave you the book. And if you tell people that, that it's, it's not about buying the book, it's for you to get purified, it's a penance. And when you give in return, you give dakshina, then you get the purification and you're able to read the book. You see the difference? So that's a point, point asking for the donation. Now they give the money. Thank you. Look, let the record show he just gave 200 rupees. <laughs> Big hand for our professor. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and then, then we say, uh, do you believe in the power of prayer? Say yes. yes. And then we have a little card that has the mom mantra and say, great. I'm going to teach you this prayer. It's meant to wake up love for God within your heart. And you hand them the card and you say, please repeat after me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. And then compliment though. You're a natural. And if it's somebody who already knows the Mahamantra Mantra said, let's do it together to bring a blessing. But lots of people, they'll chant. And just, you have to say it kind of quick. Like, you believe in the power of prayer. And if they say, no, I don't believe in prayer, then you say, great, I'm going to give you a mantra. <laughs> and then you say, I'm going to say it, so you, and you'll know how to repeat it. Are you ready? You don't give them a lot of time to think. And then, and then you say, are you ready? And they go, okay. And they go, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Now when they do that, give them a compliment. Tell them that how good they were, and then give them some prasadam. Say this is for being so nice, and then you can shake their hand or give them a fist bump. Say thank you for being so kind, and leave them with a good impression. And if they're very interested, nice kind of people, then you get their their address on one of your devices where you're following up with people, and then you're okay. You can let them, let them loose. Okay? So the first thing is make a conscious connection. Second thing is qualify. Third thing is to put the book in their hand and tell them a little bit about it. Next is to ask a question. One of the questions is, what's your secret? The next is show and tell. Tell them a little bit about the book. Show them the changing bodies. Tell them who read the book. Tell them, ask them another question. What do you do professionally? When they're laughing, you hand the book back, ask for donation, teach them the Maha Mantra, and then finally, give them some prasadam and thank them for taking their valuable time. Is that clear? Okay, there's a little card that you can donate. Uh, donate, you can donate. You can, you can download from our website, distributebooks.com that has this at a glance. And so you can go over it, you can even car carry the card with you when, you when you're distributing books. We also have a video where I'm going through the steps and telling you exactly what to do. It's on distributebooks.com, okay? Um, now I'm gonna tell you how to distribute books to Hindus because that's different, isn't it? Yes, say yes. yes. Okay. So the first principle as distributing in Hindus is don't hand them anything. Now, a disclaimer, there are many ways to distribute books. I'm just telling you several ways. You can innovate, you can do the opposite of what I'm telling you, but at least try what I'm telling you once or twice and see how it goes for you. Because then, even if you have your own way, you can develop a repertoire. And it's always good to have a few ways that you can present, okay? So here's what I do after evolving in my approach to Hindus. And we have a lot of them in Silicon Valley, almost as many as you have here. Okay, don't hand them anything, because as soon as you hand a Hindu, a Bhagavad Gita, or some other spiritual book that's related to their uh, sense of identity of religion, then they start thinking that you're embarrassing them, because they should know this. My mother, knew Bhagavad Gita, my grandmother memorized Bhagavad Gita, I know everything. <laughs> but if you don't hand them anything, it doesn't, it get, they don't have anything to hand back to you. So the second thing is just make friends. And the way to make friends, generally, like I said before, is ask where they're from. Which part of India are you from? And appreciate the place they're from. And then the next thing is Use this mantra liberally when you're talking to Hindus. And that is, you know better than me. 
you know better than me, you know better than me, you know better than me, you know better than me. So you know better than me what? The world's problems can only be solved from the spiritual platform. You know this better than me. We, and then tell them what we do. We distribute Bhagavad Gita in multiple languages and venues. We give to hospitals, hostels, hospitals, hotels, schools. And our job, we're, we're disseminating this spiritual knowledge for the benefit of the world. We're starting schools, and we print these books in many different languages. This is the best non-sectarian, you know better than me. This is the best non-sectarian knowledge coming from the Bhagavad Gita. Preface everything you're saying, you know better than me. That helps them to keep it down. That is like when you give medicine, sometimes people, they throw it back up again. They're too sick. And so when people are too sick with their false ego, unless you give them this special medicine so they can hold it down, they don't get nauseous from you teaching them something. The, the, the anti nauseum medicine is you know better than me. Everyone say it. Yeah, you know better than me. Use that at home, too. And then, then you can tell them very straightforwardly, remember, you haven't handed them anything. Don't give them a card. Don't give them a book. Don't give them prasadam. Don't give them anything. Don't put anything in their hand because that will ruin it. And they have something to hand back. As soon as they have something to hand back, it's over. They have nothing to hand back. They're stranded there. They just, they'll listen to you. And now you tell them what the program is. We're doing a fundraiser. Everyone say it. That's clear and easy to understand. And the next thing is we just ask for money. Say it. You just plug and play and just tell them this. We're doing a fundraiser. We ask for money. They don't have anything in their hand. Now it's all just a matter of the goodness of their heart, whether they believe in Bhagavad Gita. It's no longer tit for tat. It's no longer, I have this bug, I already have one, take it back, I don't have to give anything. If they have a card, they'll say, oh, I have the website, I'll, look up, I'll do it on the website. Nothing in the hand. Just tell them with the good work that they know better than you about and that you're doing all over the world and then ask them for money. Say money. Yeah, that's what we're asking for. And then they'll give you. They'll hand over tons of cash. And then as soon as they hand over money, then you give them books. Then you're free. They'll be smiling. They'll be happy. They'll be ready, open. You can pile them up with as many books, prasadam, everything that you want, and they'll go away. Everyone will be happy. Happy ending, okay? So that's it. And after they donate, give the book as a gift. Any questions about this particular approach of distributing books, even the Bhagavad Gita, to Hindus? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Like the area we live in, we distribute to books. Like many PGs are there, paying guests, where the people, uh, like young people live, but most yeah. of them don't have job, let's say. Mm. So like even when we were distributing the books, they were very interested to take the Gita because they are very much frustrated by the unemployment. But they had not even sufficient money to pay for it. Sufficient means what? Uh, means like here the book cost is 190 rupee, let's say. Well then, here's my, the way I work is, it all comes out in the wash. And get your money from somebody else. If, if, if you're distributing to people who don't have a lot of money, don't insist on a retail price. We're not a retail operation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates broke open the storehouse of the love of God. They plundered it. They stole the stuff out of there, and they went and gave it out for free. They didn't care who was a fit or unfit candidate. You all know this better than me. And, <laughs> and we're doing the same thing. Don't worry about the money. It'll come back to you. We don't know how to... We have so much... Our philosophy at ISV has always been books go out. We're not, care, we don't, we're not a retail operation. You give out as many books as we can to as many people as we can. The donation... Let me just say something about donations. It's not retail. The donation is about giving them an opportunity to reciprocate. Money is just paper. It's just a token. It's just a way for them to express themselves and say, okay... I'll do a penance because I believe in you. I believe what you just told me. And that's what bridges the gap. So if someone says I don't have any money, then I usually interpret that because everybody has money. I don't care where they live, they got money. Even homeless people have money. And you just say, this is a cry for help when they say I don't have any money. Because it's not true. 
So what they're saying is, I'll translate it for you, is that I don't know how much to give. So a lot, oftentimes to break that logjam, I'll just say, give one paisa, give one penny, give one rupee. So when you say that, they go, oh, I couldn't just give a rupee. It's like, no, no, just one rupee. Then they'll open their wallet, they'll give you 500 rupees, 1,000 rupees, whatever it is. Because now you've given them permission to give whatever they want. So even students give whatever they want. So what if they just give one rupee? and they're interested in the book, give them the book. What if they don't have, they legitimately, you shake them up and down, you pat them down, you find out there's no money on them. And then, and, then, and then they say, I'm very interested in the book. Give them the book. We're not poor people here. You know, Krishna's a rich man. He's got unlimited resource. What we're looking for is places where the books will be appreciated. The time when we don't give the books away is when people don't respect it. And that, our filtering process means we're qualifying them ahead of time. We're showing them the book and so forth. And you ask for donation, and somebody says, no, I, I don't like this. I'm not interested in it. You don't have to give them the book. But if it's a student or anybody else, and they say, I, I really want this, but I don't have any money, they just paid attention. They took their valuable time. It's more valuable money. And you can remind them that because sometimes people say, I can't take it. I didn't give anything. You say, no, you actually just gave your valuable time. And I really appreciate it. It's more valuable than money. So that's the mood that I teach. And all the places where we're working on this theory, you know, of just give out, the money always comes back. And even in a given day, when I go around to distribute, I don't care how much they give. I care about their attitude. And now what happens is I'll meet a few people. They just give under the cost. I'm not considering that because I know I walk into the next shop or whatever, somebody's going to give me way over what it's worth because they have the wherewithal to do it. And they just happen to do that. And it all comes out in the wash. And if it doesn't come out in the wash in one day, it will in two days or at least a week. It'll all work out. So that's my suggestion. Give out books as fast and as many as you possibly can because that's what we're trying to do. Okay? Any other question? Prabhu in the back. Hin by selling Bhagavad Gita to Hindus for 500. Hare Krishna. When they say they don't have cash, I will ask them to pay through phone pay or Google pay or uh, Paytm. It has worked, Prabhu. Many places, uh, they say, they, because they want to escape the situation, they say, I don't have money. I <laughs> come without money. <laughs> I say, you can pay through Paytm. <laughs> And I got many places, and the contact also we get when they pay through Paytm or Google Pay. And this has worked in some yes. places. Yes, this is very important. In fact, here's my little badge. What's on my badge? MasterCard, Visa, <laughs> Apple Pay. I, I, I don't have any cash. So here's what I say. I don't have any cash. Perfect. We don't take cash. <laughs> we take MasterCard, Visa, American Express, Venmo. And you just hold this up. This is what we take. And we don't take cash. We take, take charge. So and then you better make sure you have the dongles hooked up to your phone. They're all easy to get. You have some device here, uh, I've heard. And then you make sure that you can transfer it. And always assume the sale. that. Uh, of course, everyone does it like that. Nobody gives cash. Yeah, we, of course, we take, take MasterCard Visa. Why would we take cash? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Good point. Okay, yes? Pra Prabhuji, one more. Haribol. Uh, Haribol. Prabhuji, although, like, uh, we have not tried this approach, but in this approach, we are directly asking for the money. Yes. And without telling uh, why we are asking for the donation. No, so uh, Maybe uh, I didn't cover that clearly enough. The reason we're asking for money is we're starting schools to teach about Bhagavad Gita. Remember I said, there are many problems in the world. I start off with this. You know better than me, there are more problems in the world. There's a lot of friction. And these are coming because there's no sufficient spiritual knowledge in the world. So what we're doing is we're taking the original wisdom literatures like Bhagavad Gita and we're translating them into many different languages like Japanese, Chinese, European languages. And we're starting schools for children to learn Bhagavad Gita. And we're distributing them to many institutions like hospitals and so forth. You can give them a full.
full explanation of what we're actually doing. And so then we say, so, and for this, we're doing a fundraiser. We're collecting money to support this. And so now, today, we're just asking everyone for donations to give cash. And that's, that's the reason we're asking them to give. And you, you can elaborate on that as much as you like. And if the people are giving like 10 rupees or 5 rupees, and you know the cost of the book is more than that. But you didn't so give them a book yet. Okay. You haven't given them a book, remember, for the Hindu program? Then after that, you can decide which to give them according to their qualification. So if they give a... Prabhuji, one more. Yes? Krishna. Here, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, what should be our dress code uh, while distributing the book? Dress code yeah. means you should look nice. And the, huh? You should look nice. And here's the point. I mean, there's this, you know, dhoti, pants, shirt, kurta, sari, Punjabi, I don't know all the women's styles, what you call them, but the fact is everyone feels comfortable in a certain kind of attire. Wear what, what you feel comfortable in as long as it looks nice. So if it's you know, so-called Western or so-called Eastern, it doesn't matter as long as you feel comfortable in it. If you feel out of place when you go walk out the door, like just say you're a man and you don't, you're not used to wearing a dhoti. And besides that, you think that some of your you're going to see your boss walking down the street that day, and if he sees you in a dhoti, he's going to go, what? <laughs> and the whole time you're nervous, don't wear a dhoti. doesn't matter. Lord Chaitanya changed his dress according to what the, would attract the most people. And Prabhupada writes about it in his purports, in his books. He says that if you need to wear a certain kind of attire to preach, wear it. We're utilitarian. We're not attached to the clothes. The clothes are just like the body. We're not attached to the body, any particular culture body. It doesn't matter. So feel comfortable. I happen to feel comfortable in a dhoti because I get an advantage from it. People look at me and go, oh, you must be dedicated to some spiritual practice. But if it doesn't work for you in any given place, then adopt. And uh, at times, like when I was working in the airports in the United States, we wore very sharp modern clothes. We'd buy the best styles, best watch, everything. So when people walk up to us, you know, for a while they thought, you guys are just like some cult or something. But we were dressed better than they were. So we adapted. We changed. And they look at us and they, they, immediately they had some respect because they saw, wow, what can we say? Better shoes, better shirt, better watch, everything. And we did it as uh, yukta vairagya. So clothes for preaching means figure out what works for you, what you feel comfortable in, and then do that. We're not attached to any particular kind of dress code, except that you should look nice. Don't be a slob. Prabhu, okay, Prabhu, Prabhu, one this, more question. This no, Prabhu, you had your quota. We can move to a few more, if you don't mind. I'll come back to you. Yes, Prabhu? Like, uh, Prabhu, like in Bangalore, especially people are very busy. Like Bengal. Bangalore. Here, here, Bangalore. Bengaluru. The people are very busy, like mostly running. Um, so, like, uh, like we cannot like uh, interact the, like the way you taught, and, uh, and like <laughs> if it's then. Like, well, maybe you can. We'll try. I mean, downtown places where people are moving really fast. Those are the hardest places to distribute. It means there's a little dial, and somebody turned up Rajas. You can feel it. So those are harder places. Then you look for places that are a little more qu quiet. Mellow, you can look around and find the spots that work for you. Otherwise, if it's too intense, you may find people just running by you, and it can be, especially for newer distributors, it can be really discouraging because people are moving too fast and they're too much in passion. So find another spot. Okay? All right, so. The temples are one of the places, like people with temples, like uh, in one, two hours, uh, 30, 40 books goes like that, in temples, yeah. like Saturday weekends. Yes. But uh, they are like, uh, uh, we present like core devotionally only, Gita and all, and like devotional people themselves come. Lakshmi Narayan temple and Balaji temples and Hanuman temples and like. Yeah, that. but then you're getting only one demographic. Yeah. So point is, when you have it, when you have Sankirtan, you should test all the different spots. And try to expand your repertoire. Try to learn how to distribute books in different languages. Try to approach people from different cultures. And don't be attached to just one segment. I can only do from the temple, or I can only do from here or there. 
try to be well-rounded. Again, it's, it's sadhana. We're doing sadhana. And the more well-rounded you become, the more you'll be able to just deal with people on a soul level. Okay? Now we're going to do a few more slides. Uh-oh. Here we go. Here's some innovations in book distribution that flat out work. Can that HDMI thing go away? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Bhajra Purnima. This is the day on which the Srimad Bhagavatam says when you give away a set of Bhagavatams, you get the great gift of going back home, back to Godhead. That's one of those coupons I was talking about earlier. When you see that, you make an arrangement. So in the world, we distributed quite a few Bhajra Purnima sets last year as a global team. Altogether, we did about 7,000 sets. And this year, because I made a promise in Tirupati, in front of all the GBCs and the deities, that we vow this year, in 2020, to do at least 10,000 sets globally. I need, I need your help. Please help. I'm begging you. OK, uh, here's what it looked like in the United States. Uh, Bhajra Purnima is on September 1st. Next is festivals and events. We're finding that when you find festivals and events and you can get a table or not, even if you're just walking around, there's a concentration of people in a certain mood or attitude. And if you can find the right festivals and events, you can really do big. Uh, Motel Gita is a program which we're trying to uh, spread more in India, but we've distributed almost 750,000 Bhagavad Gitas to motels because, in, at least in America, a large percentage of the motels are run by Gujaratis. And if that's not Lord Chaitanya's arrangement, I don't know what is. <laughs> corporate Sankirtan is huge. It takes a little bit of training how to do this, but if anybody works in a corporation, we have a video, we have teams, we have a whole course in how to do corporate Sankirtan, but it's really, really big. And it, it takes uh, a little... Uh, time and finesse, but it pays off in a big way. We're talking, instead of getting donations of a few hundred rupees or a few thousand, we're talking about getting hundreds of thousands, lakhs, crores of rupees at one time in the corporations. Of course, you know a lot about that here in, in uh, India, but you can do it locally if you're not already. Kids Sankirtan is one of our most successful programs. About 10 years ago, I took five five-year-olds out with me on book distribution to see what would happen. And I brought their parents, some of their parents, a couple of parents came with me to help me out. And I took them door to door in a neighborhood near the temple. And I started noticing how fascinated they were by book distribution. The first house we went to, the doorknob was turning, but no, didn't open. And then finally, the door opened, and there was a person who was uh, mentally disabled inside. And there was a caretaker also. And the mentally disabled person saw the kids, saw the book. They wanted the book. They grabbed the book. The caretaker was trying to push it back. The mentally um, impaired person was trying to pull it in. And the kids were really engaged watching this tug of war. They'd never seen such a thing. And finally, the book somehow or other went in, the door closed and locked, and the kids were visibly exhilarated. And it wasn't just, you know, like a superficial feeling. It was they actually got it, that somebody really needed the book, and that they weren't some scholar and they wanted the book, but there was something very primal about the fact that they were grabbing onto the book that touched the kids, even at five years old. They got that. The next house I went to... There was a picket fence around the, the house. You know those little white picket fences just for decoration. And the lady was standing on her porch, and here I was approaching with five five-year-olds. And the, she could say, see me and my doti, and she saw the kids, she saw the books, and she goes from a distance. She said, oh, no, no, I'm a Christian. But the kids had no idea what that meant. So they sort of charged through the gate and surrounded her, and they started showing her the books. And they're going, look, here's Krishna, and this is a cow, and see, this is Goloka Vrindavan. And they're showing her all this stuff. And she looks up over the 
over the crowd of kids around her. She looks at me standing on the other side of the fence. She goes, all right, how much is it? <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, this kid thing is really interesting. So we started a formal program. One of our devotees, Kamesh Ridasi, started organizing the kids' sankirtan. The first couple times she took them out, they were going door to door, and then somebody rejected. They closed the door and said, get out of here. And the kids were very upset. So she took them to a nearby playground. They all sat down together in a circle, and she talked about what, what that meant, oh, what just happened. She helped them to process it. How often does a five-year-old kid get an opportunity to process something like rejection? What to speak of adults? You know, they'll go through their whole adult life not having faced rejection or at least not having known how to process it. They'll even get a PhD and then be rejected for a book you know, offer or something like that, become despondent. So I started seeing that actually kids, when they go out into the world and they start interacting with people, they, they develop a, a sense of how the world works, how the modes are working, how to communicate with people from different cultures, what's really going on out there. I saw that the kids then also began to develop leadership qualities. They got the same inspiration. He's one of the main... Uh, trainers of the kids. He's, he, after he left America over Skype and Zoom, the expert book distributor, he continues to train them through. And the kids now, many of these kids that I started with when they were five years old, some of them were just born, started going to book distribution. Now many of them are 17, 18, 19 years old. They have their own website for kids' book distribution. They take 30% of the overall goal. That's a lot because we do like $700,000 a year in book distribution. And, you know, they also, are, they develop in a very fundamentally sound way in Krishna consciousness. It gives them a taste also for hearing and chanting. So I advocate for these uh, kids' sankirtan programs. We've, we also started in the UK, and it's been very successful over there too. It also is a time when the parents and the kids can be together in their service. Because oftentimes you come to the temple, the kids go one way, the parents go another. Because the parents are doing service, the kids are playing or doing Sunday school. But here, kids and parents can go out on, together on book distribution. And um, needless to say, people are really attracted by kids when they're going out and presenting philosophy. Even Prophet mentions that when Krishna was telling Nanda Maharaj about why you should give up the Indra Yagya. They were fascinated. And Prabhupada said, people like hearing philosophy from a little kid. And so it, it, it's a win-win program. The kids become trained. It's better than an MBA when they learn how to do this. In fact, book distribution is good for everybody in that way. And it's also, it also brings a lot of energy to the sankirtan in the community. Because when wherever the kids go, that's where the parents go too. You can tell I like this program. Um, sell in bunches. Whatever you can sell one of, always sell in bunches like bananas. So we found that, you see that stack of books? That's called a saptarishi. That's seven books in one shot, tied together with ribbon. And what we're finding is it's easier to sell seven books at a time than it is one. It's easier to sell three books tied together at one time than it is to sell one book. And there's a method and a technique which is available. We just say a little bit about each book, one line on each book to describe what it does, what it does for you, and so forth, and people will take it. So it's worth trying. Gita Jayanti fundraising. For Gita Jayanti, it's one of the hugest time of the year to do this fundraising to collect money on behalf of book distribution. Language books, that's a, actually a book in um, Arabic that this man is holding, standing next to... Gopal Champu, a brahmachari from the New York uh, Yuga Dharma Ashram. And we're finding that if you have books in Arabic and you have books in other languages and you download from our website these language cards, here's an example. These are cards in Arabic. And so let's just say, does every book I can borrow, please? I need a transcendental book. Thank you, Prabhu. And Madhava, come back. Let, let's just say I meet... Ma Madhavan, he's, 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 uh, he's a Muslim from, where is he from? Saudi Arabia. And because he's so he speaks Arabic, right? And then I'll say, I'm from California, where are you from? 
Give him the microphone. I'm California. Where are you from? Saudi Arabia. I love Saudi Arabia. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Madhava kifelak. Alhamdulillah. Allah Akbar. This is from America to Saudi Arabia. And now watch. Thank you very much. When you use language cards, and I recommend that you have them with you, so you can, you can put them on a little pad like this, you see? Then you have all your cards on one ring, like that. So if somebody doesn't speak your language, you'll be happy about it. Because it's easier to sell to somebody who doesn't know your language. Just figure out what language it is, hand them the book, show them the card, and stand in mountain pose. And don't say a word. And just wait. Because then they'll give you a donation and walk away the book. And these have been very helpful in distributing books to many different kinds of people. Here's the, what I call the big four. Kids Sankirtan. I'm sorry? card says give a donation. <laughs> Essentially. We know how to say that in many different languages uh, because we learned it like mantras, like memorizing Gita verses. But actually, it, it's even more effective if you show it on a card. You don't have to learn it. It says these are spiritual books. It's slightly different in each language. What we did was we interviewed people, uh, devotees, book distributors from different countries who speak different languages, and asked them what's the most appropriate line to put on there. And that's what we put. But it all, always ends with, please give a donation. Dan Patra. Okay. So Shastra Dan. Motel Gita, Corporate Sankirtan. Okay, here's some basic principles under the category of Communications 101. Is everyone okay? Okay, do you have enough air? We're getting more air in here now. Okay, we just have, this This will be informative in a general way. These are basic principles of communication that you can use not only on Sankirtan, but at home, at work, everywhere else. But it, it's essential that we, it, uh, these are essential principles that you can use to have success in book distribution for sure. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Your tongue is a rudder. Without the rudder on a boat or a ship, the boat will go in any direction, and it's not always a good direction. So to be self-directing in life, watch out for how you use your tongue. This is called the yoga of the tongue. So on the menu today, I'm going to talk about principles and techniques of communication. So first is the principles. One is speak to the soul. When you're talking to people, remember that they're a soul. Yes to sarvani bhutani atman ivanu pashyati. Sarva bhuteshu chatmanam tatanav jikupsate. Yasmin sarvani bhutani atmai vad budvijanataha. Who knows where that's from? Which verses? Where did you say it's from? Say it. Correct. Verses 6 and 7 from the Sri Shapanishad say, when you see others, when you practice seeing others, Anupashyamiti means to follow the Shastra and follow the great souls in seeing that people are not their body. They're actually a spiritual soul. It says, if you see like that, you won't hate anything or any being. So this is the, the method. When you're speaking to someone, remember, you're speaking to a soul. It has a profound effect on the way that you communicate when you remember that, instead of thinking they're the body. Let me give you an example. In America, I don't know if you have this phenomena here in India. You may not, so you may not be able, this may not be appropriate, but you can help me out and tell me. We have a phenomena in America called road rage. Have you ever heard of that? I don't think you have it here because nobody cares how you drive here, do they? <laughs> they have it? People get angry? Okay, good. I can use the example then. I didn't notice that people cared. All right, so, so, so let's say in America somebody cuts somebody off and then they, what, you know, a person feels angry. 
Now, I have a theory behind why they feel angry. It's because it's impersonal. They don't know who's in the car. Now, imagine if somebody cuts you off and you start to feel angry. Is that possible? It's possible, right? Any of you drive? Ever get cut off? Did you feel <laughs> very regularly? Do you ever feel angry? Thank you for being so, since, so uh, straightforward. Yeah, so that little feeling of like, how dare you, right? Now, let me show you the remedy. What if somebody cuts you off and then you look in and you see actually it's your mother? She was driving the car. Would you be angry still? What if the person cut you off and you're angry, you're just about ready to lay on the horn and scream some words outside the window, and you look at it and you see it's your boss from work? How would you feel? Still angry? What if you, somebody cut you off and you looked in there and it was President, uh, Prime Minister Modi? Would you still yell? No. See, because this is an impersonal reaction. You don't know who's in the car. So you just have this general rage against the universe called rage against the machine. Like, I don't like the way I'm being treated. I'm being abused by, by time, by nature. My life's not going the way I wanted it to. And this person didn't respect me. But when you see, you personalize it, and you see actually there's a person I know in there, then it changes the relationship altogether. It changes everything. This is called Sambandha Gyan. So when you, when you know that you're talking to a soul and you remember that, Anupashyati, Anu means to follow the ways of the Shastra and remember who you're talking to. You're talking to the soul. Now it's a different way you're going to react, you're, you're going to interact with people. So speak, for, speak to the soul. Okay, that's the first part. Second one, and this is the verse that I was just quoting from Sri Upanishad, systematically sees all living entities. Next one is speak from the soul. Remember when you're speaking to people that you're a soul, you're not your body. So when you're speaking from the soul and your soul is purified, there's a different quality to the vibration. It's called saffron mercy particles. This is mentioned in the Bhagavatam by Prithu Maharaj. He says when a, a person who is pure in heart, who's speaking from the soul, speaks, the vibration is different. The vibration touches Krishna's lotus feet and it dislodges the saffron particles that are there on Krishna's lotus feet. Isn't it poetically nice? This is the imagery, right? So now imagine this. The sound vibration is mixed with what is called saffron mercy particles. And that's why when you hear from somebody who's speaking from the soul that you, you feel changed. You know, if you hear from somebody who's actually strict in their vows, they're actually experiencing some spiritual realization, now the vibration is different. It's not academic. It's actually moving. So speak from the soul. N next is the austerities of speech. Who knows which chapter of the Bhagavad Gita this is from? 17. That is correct. So these are, these are actually practical. If you practice these austerities of speech, which are being truthful, pleasing, beneficial, non-agitating, and regularly reciting the Vedas, you'll notice your whole life changes because atashri krishna namadi nabhavet grayam indriye seva mukhi jihvado swayam eva spuratyada Yoga begins with the... Say it. The tongue. And if you practice these austerities of speech, you'll notice that you become empowered. So now you should know when you're conversing with people, what is the most interesting topic to every living being? What is the most interesting topic to every living being? Correct, yes. His or her own self. This is confirmed. Look at Dale Carnegie said, Remember that a man's name is, to him, the sweetest and most important sound in any language. So if you were speaking to people and you were able to remember their name, oh, you're going to score huge points. Just remember their name. And once I was in New York and I was distributing many years ago in, in Penn Station, big train station. And so this guy, I sold him a book, and he came back half an hour later and he said, what's my name? And I couldn't remember. He goes, give me my money back. And I always remember after that how important it was
to remember people's names. And if, if you see somebody after you have, you've met them once, you see them a month later, a year later, and you remember their name, they say, hey, Deepak, how you doing? They go, hey, you remembered my name. It's a huge thing. I mean, our whole philosophy is based on knowing the name of God, right, and repeating it. So what's in a name? Everything. Remember people's names. And this is Shukadev Goswami. He says, it is his own self that is most dear to every embodied living being. So keep that in mind when you're talking to people. Don't talk about yourself. This is a mistake people make in advertising. It's done all the time. People advertise, here's the, how our company looks. Nobody cares. Here's how much we, we made last year. Nobody cares. Here's all our employees. Nobody cares. What they want to see in advertising is what they look like. They want to look at an advertisement and see a picture of themselves or their, their group. That's how you advertise, right? Where's our marketing expert? Is she still here? Right? That's good advertising. Bad, there's plenty of bad advertising. So when you're talking to people, remember, keep the conversation based on the person. Now, I'll tell you an anecdote I heard when I took a class in college, sociology class, and it was about this experiment that this guy did to prove this point. So he would get on trains, and on airplanes, and he would start conversations with somebody, and he would make sure during the whole time he was conversing that he never talked about himself. He only brought the conversation back to the other person and kept inquiring and being interested in the other person. Then, afterwards, he had a, an assistant who would meet that person and say, by the way, we're doing an experiment. We just wanted to interview you about your conversation with this person. And they would say, so what did you think of him? And they say, well, it was one of the most interesting people I've ever met. So if you want to know how to be interesting to somebody, don't start telling them about yourself. Ask them about him or her self. And that's what, where the conversation, when the conversation goes in that direction, you'll see that the person becomes edified by it. It is simply for the satisfaction of this self that the whole material creation of moving and non-moving entities exist. Bhagavatam, 10th canto. Proof positive. I mentioned this before. This is the radio station called WIIFM. What's in it for me? So when you're communicating, make sure you include that in your talk to people. What, what are they going to get out of it? And here's a principle. I'm going to save you a lot of time and trouble for dealing with fanatics. You know what a fanatic is? Fanatic. A person filled with excessive and single-minded zeal, especially for an extreme religious or political cause. Sound familiar? Have you, ever, have you ever met a fanatic? Only one person. Two, three, four, five, six. You've met a fanatic before? Have you, Mataji? Okay. Here's the law. First rule of for dealing with a fanatic. Don't. I just saved you a lot of time. Don't deal with fanatics. You don't have to. It's, I already explained it from the Bhagavatam how we're not meant to deal with fanatics. We're meant to deal with ripe fruits. So here's some techniques. Those are principles. Techniques are become a master asker. Become what? Yeah, don't tell, tell, tell. Ask, ask, ask. Ask questions. A question is a hook. It holds, it catches, it brings people back. So sometimes people say, I'm in a big hurry. Then instead of saying, no, 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 stop, that's not a question. But if I say, are you in a big hurry? They go, yeah, I'm in a big hurry. You want me to give you the five-second version? And if they say yes, they'll take a book. So remember to ask questions. And as you're giving your presentation, when you're talking to people, ask them questions. A question is also a tennis racket. It reframes. It puts the ball back in their court. So have you ever gotten a question that you couldn't answer? One person. Two, three, four, five, six. Have you ever gotten a question from somebody on Sankirtan that you didn't feel comfortable answering? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I'm going to show you how to overcome that. A question's looking glass, it clarifies. So now, answer a question with a question. This is the way to clarify. So if someone says, let's see, ask a question that I can't answer. Uh, are you Hindu? 
Nobody can answer that because nobody knows what a Hindu actually is. Um, are you Hindu? Then I would answer that question with a question because if I start saying, trying to answer about what a Hindu is, it'll just get all convoluted and difficult. But if I ask them another question, it'll clarify it. So for instance, I'll ask them back, what do you mean by Hindu? What do you mean by Hindu? And if you don't have a specific thing, you can always ask people this question, how do you mean that? Every, just repeat it. How do you mean that? How do you mean that? How do you mean that? So what happens is they have to break down their question a little bit more until you get something you can actually answer. And I'll show you more examples of this. Uh, here's another point about what's your philosophy. Um, this is something Prabhupada taught here in India. When the American devotees first and Europeans first came to India, they started meeting a lot of people who would ask them, do you believe in su Swami such and such? You know, what about Swami such and such? And then the devotees came back and said, everyone's asking us, so what about this Swami, what about that Swami? He said, Prabhupada said, ask about their philosophy. Don't deal with the Swami directly. So ask them, what's his philosophy? That's the point. What is his philosophy? And then you can compare the philosophy to the Bhagavad Gita without insulting somebody's Swami. And so that's the way to deal with those. So here's some, here's some case studies of Prabhupada asking, answering questions with questions. Srila Prabhupada, woman reporter, why do you people shave your heads? Srila Prabhupada, why do you shave your legs? <laughs> Student guest, why are most of your followers young people? Why are most university students young people? Answer a question with a question, right? Student guest, because it is the, the age of education, Prabhupada, that is also the age of Krishna consciousness. See, it came down to a point where you could really lay it out in the way you want. So you, you get it refined when you ask a question. So this means become a master asker. Don't tell, 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 but ask, ask, ask. Become a master at asking the right questions, and you can always direct the conversation in a way that you can bring it to a, a positive conclusion. Professor, why do you give sannyas to young people? Prabhupada, what do you mean by young? Now, who would think to ask that unless you're predisposed to this technique of being a master asker? So why do you give sannyas to young people? If you start trying to explain that, it's not going to come out right especially if you're on TV or something, they're interviewing you, and they ask you this question, why do you give, so why do you do this, why do you do that? Then reframe it, hit it back, it's a tennis ball, put it back in their court. Why, what do you mean by young? How is he going to answer that? <laughs> and listen, professor, silence. <laughs> Prabhupada, young means about to die. Can you say that you're, you are any older or younger th than they are? It takes it to a different, different level of communication, right? So if you learn, and, and it doesn't come automatically. You have to practice this. You have to practice asking questions. and Don't be annoying with it. There's an old cartoon about these guys. They're walking through the town, and the guy from out of town, he's asking questions about the city, and the other one's from in town. He's answering his questions with a question. And after a few blocks, the out-of-towner gets frustrated and said, every time I ask you a question, you answer with a question. Why do you do that? And the, the guy goes, why do you ask? <laughs> Don't do that. Don't be annoying. Be strategic. But remember, to ask questions. Ask good questions because it helps the person. It's to help them because they don't know what they're asking. So ask them to be more specific and ask him to ask a question that you can answer. It makes sense. Okay, where's your hometown? There's a lot of things you can ask people. There's just a few samples. San Francisco, what's your profession? I'm a doctor. What's your view on life? Life is a tumultuous journey. How many languages do you speak? Only three languages. Do you have a full set of Srimad Bhagavatam Shrim? Not yet. What is it? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Yeah. So there's a list of questions that you can develop to ask people, and you'll notice that it keeps the communication very alive and pertinent. And remember this in communication, that people respond to sincere compliments. Dear sir, this is Sanat Goswami told the Muslim J 
jail keeper. Dear sir, you are a saintly person and are very fortunate. You have full knowledge of the revealed scriptures such as the Quran and similar books. How did that, com how did that compliment work out? Really good. He got out of jail. Sincere compliments. Remember, take time to give a sincere compliment to people. Universal compliments. You look spiritual. What's your secret? Everyone say it. Say it again. Say it again. If you don't do any of the presentation, you just walk up to people on the street and you say, you look spiritual. What's your secret? You'll sell a ton of books, I guarantee you. Be a master asker. Ask this question. You look spiritual. What's your secret? 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 If I wake you up at 1 o'clock in the morning, I go, hey, you go, you look spiritual. What's your secret? You look spiritual. What's your secret? You, you take this as a mantra. It's a mantra. This is how you can distribute books. These are principal mantras that work. They're rooted in philosophy. It will work. I could tell by looking at you. So oftentimes people that give you excuses about things, they'll say that I, uh, I already know this. I already um, have one of these and so forth. I would say, yeah, I could tell by looking at you. I could tell by looking at you. You're the kind of person who would have one of these. That's, what, that's who I'm looking for. Um, Empathetic listening, if I understand you correctly, if you say that to people, listen to what they're saying and then repeat back to, you, to them. So there's more in this section. It's a little more detailed, but I'm going to skip it for now because um, I don't want to run out of time for the last uh, parts about book distribution, and we've been in here a long time, haven't we? It's been a long seminar, right? <laughs> Why do you ask? Um, now, let's just see if you have a few reflections, and I'm going to go into to, uh, any last presentations. I'm going to show you some last presentations. And while you're getting ready to answer your questions, I'm going to zip back through time for some speed learning here. See your life passing before your eyes. Everything you've seen and heard before will come before your consciousness when you leave this world. Just like that, only faster. See what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, do we have questions? Anyone? Anyone? Yes? Prabhuji, uh, you mentioned that, you know, when sometimes, you know, somebody says, I already have this book, you're supposed to respond with saying, yes, you know, I could say that by looking at you. Uh, so then how do you proceed? Because he doesn't want to take the book. He says, I have a Gita. How do you know he's not going to take the book? I don't, I don't Usually agree with that's, that. That's when they say, when we show them Bhagavad Gita, they say, okay. If I you show, if, if he said, Prince, I ran out of time. Basic principle is this. Honor objections. Honor objections. Everyone say it. If someone makes an objection to you, complain. Whatever it may be, as an example, sometimes when you hand over a book to somebody, they'll hand it immediately back because they have a designation that they feel like, I'm a Buddhist. So they don't know what the book is. They haven't read it. They don't they ask you or anything, but you say, here. And these books on yoga meditation, shows how to get free from stress, and you hand, take the book, and then you hand it right back. You say, I'm sorry, I'm a Buddhist. He said, I'm a Buddhist. So he said, I'm sorry, I'm a Buddhist. So now here's the wrong thing to do. Might you leave the mics over there or keep one. Books on yoga meditation shows you how to get free from stress. I'm a, use the mic. I'm a Buddhist. No, he's a Buddhist. So I'm taking the book back. So watch it. Say I'm a Buddhist again. I'm a Buddhist. No, 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 no. Keep it, keep it, keep it. No, no, See, I'm a if Buddhist. I do that then it, the, the energy becomes so strong that he'll reject everything. But in the beginning, when he says, I'm a Buddhist, he says, I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist. Oh, I'm sorry. I immediately take it back. No hesitation on my part at all. I take that book back. Then I give him the Buddha book. 
Can I have a Buddha book, please? What is the Buddha book? Let's see. Here you go. It can't be the same book, because let's just say that's a different book. You have a variety of books. I'm sorry, I'm a Buddhist. Oh, I'm a Buddhist. I'm sorry, I'm oh, a Buddhist. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. This is for you. Oh, thank you. As Buddha said, <laughs> the body is a house. We live within the house. We're just moving through this world. And the ultimate purpose of life is to come to understand I'm not my body, as the Buddha said. Now you're a Muslim. Oh, I'm a Muslim. Oh, I I'm can't take sorry. That. Thank you. Very. This one's for you. Oh, thank you. Allah Akbar. As oh. Allah is within everyone's heart, the purpose of life is to develop love for Allah. Nowadays, people are distracted by the external world. They forget all about developing love for Allah. Our main purpose is to teach everyone to remember Allah and love Allah. Today, we're doing a special benefit to spread love for Allah, and we just ask for a donation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. So, thank you. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Other, um, we just have a couple more minutes for some reflections or questions. Prabhu. And then all the way in the back, back in right field. Prabhu, a couple of principles are uh, <clears throat> speak from the soul is one principle. Yes. And then we also have to speak what is the most important thing for that person. So aren't these two things contradictory sometimes? Speaking from the soul and uh, speaking something important for the person. Speaking from the soul is more of a, a subtle thing. It's more your, of the mentality of remembering that you're a soul. And it would be in the vein of doing service for service. When I'm speaking as a body and a mind, I have an ego involved and I'm thinking there's different ways that, that I can sabotage my book distribution. One way is to think that I'm the controller and everyone should obey me. Especially when you start to develop techniques and you start thinking I'm, I'm powerful, I'm like a mystic yogi, I can influence people. And then when they don't get influenced by you, you get all upset because like you're supposed to obey me. This is demoniac. I want everyone to obey what I say. So be a soul. Just remember, be in your existential situation. You're not your body, you're not your mind, you're not powerful. You're representing Krishna and you're doing service for service. That's what I mean by speak from the soul. And if you stay in that position, then people will notice it and you'll notice it too, that you don't become smashed by the subtle subtleties of your interactions with people. They become painful if you're attached to your ego. I have to control or I have to have everyone take a book. That's not reasonable. Don't base your idea of success on Sankirtan with everyone taking a book. It's successful just walking out the door as an act of devotion for Krishna. Feel successful devotionally that you did the right thing. You went out. So what? You didn't sell a book. Krishna doesn't mind. And, you know, be an instrument. And if he decides to work through you in a certain way, then fine. Otherwise, be equipoised. Be happy. Does that help? Thank you. Prabhu, all the way in right field. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Yes. So, like, uh, what I have observed is that Krishna uh, always reciprocates uh, when we go out for book distribution. You notice that? Yes. Yes. Krishna is responsive to every living entity, and when we go out on book distribution, he reciprocates. Sometimes the reciprocation, I was talking to Madhav Govinda yesterday when we were on a walk, and he was saying sometimes when he's going out distributing, he'll feel like he figured it all out, how to perfectly present a book so everyone will take and then he starts to develop a thought that, like, I really know how to do this. And then the next day, Krishna reciprocates by taking away all his powers. <laughs> and then you have to start all over with the Advaita Acharya mentality was, Krishna, please help me. I don't know anything. <laughs> so, you know, it's self-correcting book distribution. This is one of the reasons it's very powerful service. It's high sadhana because it's self-correcting. You're learning how to be a better person. You're learning how to better serve Krishna with your mind, your words, and everything, and be equipoised because you're constantly under pressure. Like when athletes train, they put themselves under undue pressure, un unnatural pressure. Like, you know, people who are training for marathons, they'll, they'll run up hills. You don't normally run up hills, do you? In your daily life, any of you? You run up hills? But athletes do that all the time because it puts more pressure on them. 
Because that way, when they actually come to the actual race, they actually have already prepared for it. So book distribution is like that. It's more pressure than you're going to get in most places. In your mind, preparing for it, going out, meeting one person after another who has conflicting opinions with you sometimes, not very often, but sometimes. And you're going to see that because of that, exposing yourself to it, just like an athlete does, you start to get strong spiritually, mentally. The way you interact with the world and other people becomes much more informed and you're more deliberate about the way you work in the world because that's how you're training yourself by your high sadhana of going on book distribution. And it also prepares you for all kinds of reversals. It's, uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, stay equipoised whenever there's reversals. So when you go on book distribution, you're guaranteed that you're going to get more reversals per hour than you are when you're going to sit at home and flip through the social networks. Guaranteed. You get flabby. You get flabby mentally, spiritually, looking at social media, just, just sitting there and watching. But when you go out on book distribution, you're reacting. It's like spiritual kung fu 24 hours a day. You're, you're mentally, you're dealing with all these situations. And it's a really good thing that you fail in certain circumstances because then you come home hungry and humble. And that's where you want to be. You want to be hungry and humble and come back. And that way, when you hear the Bhagavatam, it's like elixir. You're, you're soothing your soul. So that's why I said the two things together, hearing and chanting and going on Sankirtan, it's super sadhana. Last question. Better be good. OK. Prabhu here, because he didn't get one yet. Can you explain a little bit on that uh, saffron mercy particle? What yes. It's palpable. When you hear somebody speak that actually has realization, it's different from an academic approach. Academic approach may make your mind go like, wow, why did this per how did this person learn so much? But then there can also be a factor of envy. It's like, you know, who does he think he is? But when somebody's speaking from the soul, it actually has realization, then the heart changes. And you start thinking like, I should surrender. That's the difference. So it's very powerful. And this is what we're, what we're testing ourselves always. Are we speaking from the soul? Are we developing this humility through which we deal with the world in an enlightened way, and in a way in which we're seeing it's all connected to Krishna? And it's, so, and it's purifying me. Thank you very much, everybody. You've been an amazing, amazing audience. I'm, it's just been a, a fantastic experience for me to be with you for this, these last several hours. And now for the best part, we get a chance to walk out the door and touch the pavement together. And nobody's expected to perform today. You're not a circus animal. We're just going out because it's the right thing to do together. And I came all the way down here specifically to do this with you. And I'm looking forward to touching the pavement with you. I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm not putting any expectation on myself. You don't put any expectation on yourself. Just that we feel what it's like to go out together. The hardest part of book distribution is troop movement. It's getting everyone from this place to wherever we're going, especially in Bangalore, because there's more traffic here than in any other city in the world. So we're going to try that together in just a little while and, we'll, and see what the team works like. And hey, if we feel like it, after we touch the pavement, then we're going to walk around and talk to a few people and remember some of these principles and just try to employ them and see what happens just as instruments with no expectation whatsoever. And then later on, we're going to come back and we're going to meet either tonight or tomorrow morning. And we're going to exchange realizations about what happened to us when we walked out the door. Does that sound OK? Say yes. OK. <laughs>